Hi, my name is Angela Chavez, the Communications Director at Courage California, and you're listening to Courage. It looks good on you. If you joined me last month, I gave a quick overview of what voter engagement looked like for the California primaries. And spoiler alert, we have room for improvement. And if we hope to pass critical and historical ballot measures on November 8th, we're going to have to say it with me now. Get out the vote. In this episode of Courage, It Looks Good on You, we speak with organizers who work within some of our state's most diverse communities about what happened during the primaries. We'll learn about what the challenges were in the different regions and what organizers identify as the GOTV needs of the communities they serve to ensure that all eligible voters in California are empowered to make their voices heard in November. Before I pass the mic over to today's guest, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge our presence on the traditional and unceded territory of hundreds of First Nations who are the traditional caretakers of the land that we call California. Hello, everyone. I'm Jay Chardamal, Courage California's Senior Communications and Voter Engagement Manager. And as Angela mentioned, today we are going to discuss the California 2022 primary election. And for this conversation, we are joined by James Harrard from Lift Up Contra Costa and Cindy Lee from Hmong Innovating Politics. Hi, Cindy and James. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Jay. Thank you for having me. Hi, Jay. Hi, James. It's great to see y'all. Do y'all just mind providing a brief introduction of yourselves, a little bit about your organization and the role you have within that organization? And let's start with James. Wonderful. Yeah. So James Harrod, as you mentioned earlier, I am the executive director for Lift Up Contra Costa. We serve as a C3 and a C4 here in the community of Contra Costa County. And my role here is really to help develop and create coalition of like-minded individuals, like-minded community groups who focus on creating a just and equal society for all of us here. Great. Thank you, James. Cindy? Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me in this space. Um, I work with Hmong Innovating Politics, or also known as HIP. We are a C3 org that we kind of focus around like youth support, um, API focus, and very bring up the votes kind of manner. Our main office is located in SAC, but I am the Fresno team lead for the office of Fresno. Great. Thank you, Cindy. I'm really excited that we have two folks from different parts of the state. So let's just hop into the discussion. As mentioned earlier, we're going to be talking about California's June primary, the election results, and voter turnout. So as you know, Cindy and James, there are a little under 22 million registered voters here in California, but only 33% of those registered voters showed up to cast a vote in the primary election. I think most of us expected, you know, these slightly low voter turnout numbers, but I'll admit I was a little surprised to see these numbers. And I think my surprise came from at first, I was comparing these last turnout numbers to the 2020 primary which isn't a fair comparison, right? Because we had a very polarizing presidential election within that, which obviously drove turnout. But when I dove deeper into the the data over time, what I saw was that this past primary actually did better than previous ones. So in 2018, comparing 2022, excuse me, to 2018, voter turnout was actually higher in the primary when you're looking at like the gubernatorial race. I just wanted to ask y'all, What happened in the June primary? What are some of the challenges of getting folks to turn out? And what would you like to lift up and celebrate? And let's start with you, Cindy. Yeah, so for us, I kind of feel like I look at it as an opportunity for folks within smaller communities to kind of lift up and take action and share their voices, right? But I think the challenge with that is a lot of community members, especially like in smaller areas, such like Fresno or Central Valley, there's it's very diverse. And with that comes the barrier of like uneducated folks and just not having that type of support with around the political system itself. I think there's a lot of minor challenges that comes with that, like language barrier existence, you know, not having the support to or the accessibility to participate and put their voices to use. And a lot of folks here aren't really aware of the importance or the value behind the primaries. So that kind of brings out like almost like a negative lens on the primaries where it's almost overlooked to a lot of the people here, even though it should be something that we paid closely attention to, even though it's not broadcasted and as popularized as the general election. And then some of the things that we personally kind of celebrated here with PIP, it's just we're really trying to transition into uplifting youth and supporting youth programs and just making sure our communities are acknowledging like the development of how the system is now and how 
the world kind of is functioning and like the youth are our future, right? So we want to be able to provide that support and education to them around the political topics and political areas that we're trying to support them in, as well as guiding the older audience and community members that we do have that may have a hard time making that connection with their political stance. So that's kind of where we're at at the moment, but we were able to kind of celebrate some of the high points of just being able to outreach like we usually do and being able to go and speak to folks and really hear grandmas and grandpas of our AAPI community share like, oh, wow, like it's really important and it's really good for them to kind of see a familiar face and someone that speaks their language looks like them educate them on like these different things that they didn't know about like they didn't know that their voices matter so in that sense we're always kind of uplifting that just to remind everyone that your voice does matter and we do really have the power of movement in numbers so that's kind of something we're doing at hip here and then i can go ahead and pass it on over to jane wonderful thank you cindy that's a great assessment and to my point uh, jay i think it's gonna be a little bit conflicting on both sides only because the data spoke in two different ways, right? I think what really drove a lot of the turnout was the accessibility to the ballot, right? I think more voters having more access to the ballot allowed for a much larger electorate to participate in this election over the 2018 elections. But also in that same regard, there wasn't that many attractive top ballot candidates that were really running in the primary elections that really would have attracted voters to really want to participate in a more concerted fashion. I think a good parallel to that is the recall election that we had last fall, where we saw record numbers of voters really participating in the electorate. While albeit in the primary election, we saw a lot of that trickle uh, taper off simply because I guess 2022 was the calendar year that people thought that COVID and the pandemic was over. <laughs> and we, as we all know, it is not. It's actually on the rise again. But I think as people start to return back to normalcy, re return back to normal life, we're going to see a little bit more tapering off until we have attractive issues, attractive ballot measures, and attractive candidacies that are really, really going to engage the electorate and really ask them to perform and turn out in those races. There are several things in the Contra Costa election this past primary season that we really, really want to uplift. One being the candidacy of Roxanne Garza. Albeit she didn't win her primary election, but her candidacy really drove the conversation about what this equity and equal and just community looks like and what this accountability looks like when it comes particularly referencing to law enforcement. Roxanne's race and the Board of Supervisors District 4 really, really galvanized a certain part of the electorate to really come out and perform and vote in her favor when she faced massive opposition and a crowded field. Another great lift up that we wanna also acknowledge is the re-election of our district attorney, Diana Beckton. As we saw in this primary election, DA races around the region were either being recalled or they were losing those races. Diana Beckton was the only candidate in the region that won her re-election, not handedly, but with a decent enough margin that sends a message to the establishment, that sends a message to law enforcement, that sends a message to the community that reform is real and we can be safe and the both can live synonymously together and we don't have to be afraid that when we talk about progressive values and progressive reform, that it also includes safety in our communities. To your point with uh, the re-election of DA Becton, James, it's incredible because we see so much misinformation out, you know, in the media, online, in terms of California's commitment to restorative justice, criminal justice reform. And it's nice to see that, you know, we are still committed despite all of the misinformation that comes our way. And you spoke to the tapering off of voter turnout. And Cindy, you spoke a little bit about the importance of primaries and these votes. James, you alluded to it with folks like winning re-election in the primary, right? So just generally, what would y'all say low turnout means when it happens? Like, what does it mean for representation and why should folks be out there voting? I would like to just dive into this just a little bit more. And James, I'll kick this one to you first. Thank you. Absolutely. So low turnout means low representation, right? It means a dampening of your voice at the ballot box to elected officials about what values truly matter to you and how that should be reflective in their candidacy and in their policies. When we talk about low turnout, particularly here in Contra Costa, I'm going to be the first to tell you that, you know, our, our local government that officiates our elections didn't do such a great job at notifying the public that the election was actually happening. We've had some voters, when we go to door-to-door -to -door canvassing, had mentioned to us that they hadn't received a voter guide up until maybe a month before an election. 
Now that's not a lot of time. I know some folks may think a, a, a month in advance is enough time for you to be able to cast your ballot. But when you're balling back into the hustle and bustle of normal life and you have kids who have to go to, to games and you have family members to visit and you have scheduled meetings for work and personal time for yourself. And you also have to imagine some at some point in time, self-care has to also be a part of that schedule, right? People are going to miss the ballot when it comes in the mailbox, right? People are going to miss that voter guide and chalk it up as more junk or more advertisement or more flyers that really doesn't speak to them or their values or their issues. And so when we see low turnout in primary elections, we have to let voters know that when you don't turn up to these elections, you're telling establishment candidates who don't share your values that you're okay with them trampling over your civil rights and civil liberties. If we do not get involved in our primary elections, we leave ourselves for a very bare field when it comes to the general elections and a very nightmare scenario of choosing who is the lesser of two evils. So I feel like Contra Costa did really well then without, you know, having that information come from local government in, you know, a timely manner, an accessible manner, because y'all actually performed above the average, right? Like somewhere around 35%. So y'all did some great work with getting folks out despite the lack of information. So that is, oh, that's I, pretty impressive. I attribute that to the progressive community that exists here in Contra Costa County. They really put their nose to the grindstones and put their boots on and really knocked on tremendous amount of doors to make sure that the electorate understood that the elections that were happening were going to determine the next two to four years of our lives. And if we didn't get involved, we we're all in for a world of hurt. Yeah. Cindy, would you like to add anything about low voter turnout and what that means for communities? Yeah, a lot of the points um, were already made by James, but I do agree that like the low turnout definitely gives all these candidates the okay of like whether you want this to pass or not pass, they don't really, they don't really matter. Like, let's just disregard it. Let's do what we want to do. Let's keep it on the hush hush and let's get it done. Let's keep it moving. But the thing is that community members aren't understanding if you're not showing up. And another factor in it is the fact that it is very red and blue, right? There are a lot of the other folks that are in the in-between parties or if those two parties are so hyper-valued, all the other in-between folks, they don't feel like they're acknowledged or they don't feel like they need to be a part of the conversation because I don't agree with that or that. So like, might as well not do anything. But by you not doing anything, that's giving them the okay to go ahead and almost like misuse that power and that advantage and do what they want with this time, this opportunity, and all this money. So I think that's where a lot of the lower turnout may be causing, you know, like that may be some of the results of these low turnouts. Oh, definitely. When you look at the uh, breakdown per party, independent voters just didn't show up <laughs> in comparison to Republicans and Democrats. So that's, that's an excellent point, Cindy. Thank you for, for lifting that up. So, Cindy, I know y'all knock on doors and talk to voters, and James, you alluded to the progressive movement doing incredible work in Contra Costa County in order to inform folks that elections were even happening, that voter guides will, should be coming their way. Can you all speak to what voters care about when you're out doing this work, and what does and doesn't work when we talk to voters about issues that their community is facing? And let's start with you this time, Cindy. Yeah, thank you. I feel like I've also done, like, begun working with HIP through canvassing and outcasting and stuff like that. And so with that, I feel like what works best from what from my personal experience is speaking the language with the people I am trying to outreach to, right? So I feel like that's definitely an advantage point there and sharing similar stories. Storytelling definitely helps a lot. Personal experiences, that definitely helps you make that connection and build that community relationship within your community, within the people that are they're trying to serve and support and outreach to. But um, I feel like that all, a lot of the voters definitely do care about personal investment, I guess, personal investment on top of like local changes. But ironically enough, even though they want that local change, they don't know how to participate or how to input their voices to push those changes for the better, you know? And I think what doesn't work is it's shaming your community members or pressuring them to go one way or the other. Yes, we want to push for this swing type of vibe, right? But I don't think shaming anybody because of their race, their culture, their personal beliefs, their political lens, that definitely does not work. Yeah, in my experience. Yeah, I'm always skeptical when I read papers about like using social pressure in a certain type of way, right? <laughs> to get folks to show up and vote and kind of like guilt trip them into to it, right? Like 
folks are going to vote if they have something to vote for. If they don't have something to vote for, they're not going to show up. And I feel like guilt tripping folks means you don't really have something for them to show up for. But if you had a vision, hope, then they would, would definitely turn out. James, do you agree? Do you disagree? What are you hearing out there? <laughs> no, I, I completely agree. I think like, you know, the social pressure sometimes can be a deceptive way to have people participate, not fully understanding or fully have depth knowledge about why they're participating and what are their true reasons for voting one way or the other. I think in these unprecedented times, voters have a very precisive view of what they really want and what's important to them, not just for right now, but for the long term. In Contra Costa County, we've seen voters vote in record numbers to support the re-election of Diana Beckman, as I mentioned earlier. But we also saw uh, voters go out and vote in record numbers in a, to vote in a sheriff's race that hadn't been challenged in so many cycles before now, right? And we saw that represented again in Roxanne Garza's race when they're voting for the true left progressive candidate in these races. And what voters truly care about are the things that really was what we all care about, right? Housing, safety, reimagining public safety, right? And also what, what does public safety look like in the face of a pandemic and infectious disease, right? So when we knocked on doors and we had conversations with voters and we were talking about what was really important to them, more conservative publications and more conservative uh, uh, media groups really emphasized the need to use our terminology in a lot of their messaging to their base, right? One of the things that we saw clearly was when the use of real criminal justice reform <laughs> And in a publication that supported Diana Beckton's opposition candidate was really interesting to us because we recognize that they too see the importance of the terminology and the words, but it was our job to be able to brief the communities on the education behind those terms and what that actually meant. It wasn't just a changing of the vanguards, it was more so a changing of ideals and values of how these systems can actually work for the communities themselves. And that also is synonymous with safety and also infectious disease. As we saw in this last two years, these, uh, these systems that were put in place to protect us were done so by progressive candidates in an aggressive way to ensure that the most, the most vulnerable people in our communities, and we're talking about those who are disenfranchised, those who are immigrants, those who are previously incarcerated, who are coming, returning back to society and not having a really decent re-entry program. And those of us who are unhoused or those of us who are unemployed, we're gonna be impacted the most. And so these measures that were put in place by these progressive candidates is really what kept us safe through this pandemic to be able to come out on this other side. And these are the same issues that people are still talking about at the doors. We still wanna feel safe in our communities, but we still wanna make sure that we have places for folks who are unhoused and create systems to support and uplift them back into our society. And we also wanna make sure that I don't get monkeypox, so I don't get COVID for the second time, right? And so these were the values that voters thought that were really important in this primary election. And they're going into this general election with the same mindset. And I think this is still gonna be the, the consensus going into 2024. Great. So slight tangent from the present questions, but you just got me thinking, James, in terms of like the co-opting of terms and reforms, right? And how the other side uses that to their advantage. Do you think that comes from us, meaning progressives? I know it's a very loaded term. <laughs> um, <laughs> not celebrating our wins, not lifting them up and actually letting folks know what we are accomplishing. I feel like those of us in the movement are just so focused on the next thing or defending what we had won, oftentimes we forget to really just take a moment to celebrate what it is we actually accomplished. I mean, we saw this with legislation coming from the federal government. You know, you had Republicans who didn't vote for it and then were out with their constituents praising, you know, certain bills that actually were implemented and signed into law. So what would you say is the symptom of that co-opting and how do we fight back against it? I think you I think you hit the nail on the head there. I think we do not do a good enough job to advocate to promote and distribute information that shows these victories and these wins broadly. We don't communicate to enough communities how uh, certain elected officials championed on certain issues to ensure that you know what my my home, my family, my business is protected. And a great case in point is that as Diana's backed in prosecution for the looters of the people of a, of, a, of a looting in the Walnut Creek area earlier this year, or, or late last year, actually. And the publication actually came out and said, you know what, Diana Becton is not keeping you safe. She's letting looters run wild. Crime is rampant in Contra Costa County. 
which in the fact is not the case, right? She actually did charge and prosecute looters that committed a crime of a certain extent. So that way she can show that she held everyone who broke the law accountable, but we didn't do a great job at promoting that, right? We didn't do a great job at letting the community know that she was keeping us safe, that she was doing her job. And in fact, she was doing her job so well, she was doing it while also revamping the, <laughs> the DA's office here in Contra Costa County. Cindy, would you like to add anything? Or do you also experience the co-opting of terms when you're out talking to voters? Yeah, I feel like that's definitely something that gets brought up quite often, just when you're asking, like, um, I feel like the older generations of folks, just because I feel like we tend to hyper focus on what's going wrong, or what we want to change, what's not working, um, that does tend to blur the progressiveness a little bit and I feel like we have this thing at hip where we kind of say we celebrate a little win like a little win is still a big win so we have to make all the efforts to enjoy these little wins on the way to fulfilling this bigger goal that we're trying to achieve so you're 100% right in the sense where we always being in this work we're always focusing on what's next what's next right like what's the next move what's the next measure what's the next campaign we're working on but being able to accomplish something small is definitely very, very rewarding as well. And it's just as rewarding to be able to have felt that being the one doing the groundwork and being a part of the team that's trying to shift that paradigm is definitely very rewarding. And it's, you're hundred percent right in the sense that we don't talk about that stuff enough, like the good wins. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I would also say like the little wins have such a ability to transform folks lives right like I think most people don't really connect the dots and we got into this a little bit earlier James you spoke about it in terms of like top of the ticket races really driving turnout but we know that it's the lower ballot races that have the most impact on your life city council school board if you want like if folks are driving too fast in your neighborhood and you want a speed bump or a stop sign there that's local government that will do that and that's part of public safety right so like those I feel like folks consider little wins, but are actually huge. And they mean a lot to, to our community. I would argue more than <laughs> the stuff that actually gets folks to turn out, meaning the top of the ticket president and stuff like that. Okay, so let's take what we've learned from the primary and see how we can apply that to the future. November is coming up super fast, y'all. I think the time of this recording, we're approximately 85 days out, which seems like a lot, but it's gonna creep up on us. And before we know it, Halloween's going to be here and voting day is going to be come and gone. So what needs to happen in future elections and for the general so that we can increase turnout? And James, I'll let you take this one first. To increase turnout, there was this old terminology when I first cut my teeth in the political work is that if you want to increase turnout, you have to increase your base. If you want to increase your base, you have to increase voter registration. And I think that's sort of like morphed into something completely different now in 2022. If we want to increase turnout, we have to increase voter education. The more time we spend in front of voters, educating them on the issues that are most important, on the values that they care about, how that's represented in political office and the candidacy or the, or the, or the race of candidates, gives us a better opportunity. It gives us a better chance in really having a deep and engaging conversation about how they're going to create or how they're going to like commit to making a decision in the elections. And that's participation at all, right? Like the one thing that we often try to do here on the ground is that we want to ensure that when we go to the doors, we're not projecting our issues or our values onto the person that we're speaking to, but we're really doing this active listening process where we're hearing what the concerns are important to them and how does it relate and connect back to the reasons why we're knocking on that door today. Uh, another great way to do turnout, uh, to increase turnout, is by having a real uh, voter plan for voters, right? Walking them through the steps on what they plan on doing and how do they plan on voting. Uh, many, many moons ago, when I was canvassing doors on a 24-hour basis on electoral seasons, um, it was important for me to make sure that the voters understood a few things. One, yes, they were committed to voting in the election. Two, they had a date and time that they had set to do so. And three, that they were going to talk to one or two other people to about the elections on the same conversation that we're having at the door to inform their friends, their family, their sphere of influence about what's valuable and what's not and who is important and who isn't and why should they be participating in these elections in this way. And so I will leave it there and pass it on to Cindy. Thank you, James. I feel like in order to kind of make some changes or bring out more voters and stuff like that. Of course, you definitely feel like, I feel like we need to normalize the communication around voting, 
just in general, like we got to start educating definitely like how James said, it's really important to educate our folks on, you know, the importance of it and normalizing that kind of conversation. Like there's no right or wrong, but it's just, are you doing it? Are you participating? This is your right of being here to do that. So it's not necessarily a scale or of remembrance of like, are you, are you part of that group or are you not? It's, we got to like rebrand it. There's a lot of rebranding and reorganizing of the terminologies around voting. And I think just a lot of that stigma comes with a lot of shaming because if you don't know how to work the ballot, then you, there's a lot of internalizing that comes around that and you don't, you don't want to be wrong and you don't want to vote for the thing that you're not advocating for. And you don't want to seem as though you don't, you're ignorant, right? But in order to bring out more voters in order to vote for, to help these people participate within the general elections and all the more local stuff like the primaries, it's definitely going to take a lot of rebranding. And with smaller communities here, um, yeah, I think it is going to really come down to re-educating folks on voting, like the voting rights and just the reminders. And like James said, like a month notice of the ballot guide, that's not enough time. Everyone's really busy. You have your kids, you have work, you have your self-care time. Like it's just if you don't set an amount, a time or date to come and focus on that and look over the ballot, like really reflect on what are your morals, your values, what are you trying to change? What are you as a person trying to push for? Then you're really not going to participate. And I think that's where a lot of the challenges come from. So quick follow up to the rebranding, Cindy, or it's probably a, a little bit of a tangent, not a follow up specifically, but you work a lot within and you organize AAPI communities, correct? Yes. So do you feel like the state and local government provides you with enough in language resources that could reach folks where they are at, you know, to James point, like, we don't want to talk at folks, we really want to be there with them and have that trusted relationship because we know a trusted messenger is going to go a lot further than someone just coming in from any political party talking a couple of weeks before you know an election and then leaving the community do you feel like y'all have enough of that support in the the central valley um i feel like there's definitely been an improvement from like 80s 90s but definitely definitely not just because a lot of the times within these smaller communities they folks don't know where to go to get the language assistance. And within these voting centers, yeah, this, this is a live voting center, but if you don't have anyone that speaks the language or can translate or can help support them, they're not going to want to participate and they're going to feel outcasted and they're going to feel ashamed and ignorant. Like, like why, why am I even here? Like my vote doesn't really matter. So they'd rather not participate. We've definitely made improvements, but we still have a long way to go. Yeah, I mean, I would say voting is intimidating, even for folks like myself who do this work, right? Like you get the ballot and there's so much on there and there's so many races where you can't find websites for certain candidates. So adding another layer of not having that accessible and feeling like embarrassed to go in there, it's not how we encourage folks to partake in in government. And that's definitely, we're not going to get to a model of co-governance if we continue to exclude folks because of uh, accessibility. So Thank you for that. And hopefully we can get going on that. But another follow up, do you rely more on like the local community then to do that rather than local government in terms of communicating, translating ballots? Or is that something that it's just the infrastructure needs to be completely built out? I feel like the infrastructure is just a little outdated, like within the voting system itself, the political system, we do just need to kind of have a little bit more support for those who are disabled or don't speak the language, like little stuff like that definitely makes an impact. And by not having that, you're excluding a whole popular group just because it's an inconvenient to you when the funds are there. You're making the choices not to supply that, not to provide that assistance. And that's something within the system that I feel needs to be adjusted. But um, we do do a lot of like hands-on workshops or like translating on screen, on site, being C3, we're not allowed to necessarily help them with their ballots when we're out canvassing and knocking door to door. But we are kind of collated with like some other programs where they do do a lot more of the direct one-on-one -on -one translating, which I've also done, but it would definitely come back to the org and depending on how much they can provide that support for the system, for the community members. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, I find it very interesting too, James. Do you have any thoughts? 
you know what, I, I, I never thought about it that way. And AAPI community organizing has been something in the back of my mind here that we wanted to sort of like see if, see if, we, if there's something that we can do to help assist in that community. And we might want to connect a little bit offline, Cindy, just to pick your brain a little bit about how we can probably mimic your model here in Contra Costa County. Yeah, let's go. We're definitely down. Like, I, I feel like it's not just AAPI because I feel like a lot of the, I mean, sorry, it's not just Hmong. Like, yes, our organization is called Hmong Innovating Politics, but we're definitely covered under the umbrella of like AAPI. So we do try to provide the language assistance through other orgs if we can't do it directly. But for the most part, we do cover a larger portion of the Hmong folks here in the Central Valley area. Mm. I love this. Bringing people together in real time. <laughs> it's something Courage really prides itself on. So, But this is a great segue. I have one last question for y'all, and it's super broad, so take it wherever you want. But what should Californians be doing to get their family, networks, friends excited, voter education as it pertains to the, the general election that's coming up, like I said, approximately 85 days this coming up November? Go ahead, James. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, I think uh, what Californians can do more of is they need to demand more from local government that are officiating these elections to provide more ways to have access to not just the ballot, but submitting the ballot or dropping the ballot off. And uh, one of the things that I know was a was a huge hit for us here in Contra Costa was the was the uh, not removal but shrinking of. Uh, ballot drop-off locations, right? I think a lot of communities had an, an advantage to where they didn't have to drive several miles to the supervisor of elections office to drop off a ballot when they could have driven to like the local library or the local trusted government's office to drop off those ballots. And that really, really affected the electoral turnout here because most folks who uh, have that historical context about voting um, usually like to go on election day and cast their ballot in person because it was they fought so hard for it, their ancestors fought so hard for it, so they choose to vote in that fashion. And through this pandemic and through the, the pivots that we had to do as a community, um, those drop-off ballot places acted as a, like, a, like a secondary option for that, for that process, right? And so the removal of drop-off locations or the, or, the, or the limiting of drop-off locations really will impact the, the electoral turnout. And then also like families need to start having conversations. And I know this is an antiquated term, but uh, families need to have conversations at the dinner table, right? Uh, I know we don't probably have dinner as much as we used to two years ago, but we need to start creating these, these spaces of where uh, uh, people can feel safe and, and, and really interject their opinions about what they feel about these local races, not necessarily the individuals or the politicians that are running, but what the impact of this election is gonna have on their lives in terms of policy changes. And, and if we do it that way, we can create a sense of real dialogue amongst our friend group and our friend and our family groups to where people won't have to feel so attacked or feel triggered, but we can start having real genuine conversations about, hey, if this thing passes, it's gonna affect me this way. And I think that emotional connection to one person is how we think about the values of our own selves and our own vision of what our community should reflect in terms of policies. And so when we want to change things, I think we do so in a great and passionate way when we do it together. And I think by having a more open dialogue conversation is the way that we continue moving that forward. Um, and, you know, we have to be in part of these local clubs and some people have memberships to so like the Kiwanis clubs or these chamber of commerce clubs or these social groups or these uh, 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 mommy and me groups, right? I think all of those are important because when we're talking about what's going to affect us, it's, it affects everyone. And I think we're feeling the effects of that now, currently in this electoral season, that we would have faced it uh, about two or three cycles ago. Yeah, that was great, James. And, you know, I never quite got the sentiment that's going around during Thanksgiving time where folks are like, don't talk to your family about issues. Mm -hmm. I'm like, no, talk to your family about issues exactly. because they see the real impact of how they vote impacting your life. I mean, we saw storytelling being so successful in so many movements, right? And for me, what comes to mind is the LGBTQ plus movement, right? Like folks really learning that they had queer members of their family or their neighbors and that, you know what? In fact, it's not a big deal. People just want to love and be loved. <laughs> like, so definitely having those real conversations, I think is, is a starting point. So yeah, um, thank you for that, James. And 
I'll admit one of the things I've missed the most the past couple of years is not having those large family dinners because that was that was a big thing in my family and hopefully soon we get back there again safely. Uh, Cindy, what about you? I definitely agree with the conversation and holding space to have these kind of dynamic conversations where they're not necessarily advised to have, I guess. Um, I think having those difficult or uncomfortable conversations are definitely a great start, maybe at home, maybe with your friends, or maybe like with your coworkers, or um, something we've kind of done here at HIP is we, within this past primary, we had this boba ballot party. So we kind of, it's, you don't have to come, but if you would like to be part of the conversation, you're more than welcome to. So it wasn't necessarily as though um, who's to vote for, who's good, who's bad, but we really highlighted it just, we kind of just wanted to hold space for all of our outreachers to kind of share their questions or like, what are the responses you're getting? Or how do you feel when you get this type of response from a community member? They look like you, they sound like you, they have the same culture, same history, but they feel something different. So let's, let's discuss why. It's not necessarily like who's good and who's bad, but it's just, how do you feel? What's your points on that? Like, why do you feel you should support this act? How do you feel about this measure? Like, I, I feel strongly about this measure because of this and this and this, but we're all speaking from I tense. So you're only speaking about your perspective instead of being like, everyone needs to do this. Everybody needs to do that. This is right. This is wrong. So that's kind of something that we are trying to bring up more. So we're kind of planning on having another boba party um, towards the generals, right? But we're going to make it, the idea around it is to be as inclusive as possible and just to kind of hold space for folks to kind of ask their questions that they feel uncomfortable asking their parents or their sisters or their brothers. Like it's just to kind of encourage everyone to kind of start thinking, like start thinking, but at the same time, show yourself some grace and be patient because this is a long-term journey. We're not looking for the little, yes, we're celebrating the little ones, but it's not, it's not anything that's going to change overnight. So in that sense, we want to also just show everyone some grace and you're allowed to have and feel the way you do. So like, that's kind of the vibe that we want to support or give out, I guess. And I think Californians can kind of use a little bit of that just because everyone's so mixed and the state, like you said, is so big. Right. And yeah, let's see. Let's, let's, let's see what happens. Boba and voting, two things I love. So I hope I can make it to one of those (laughs) ballot parties. That is incredible. Cindy. I love um, events like that, right? Because they just feel like that's my space. I want to go there. It's not intimidating. So I I love that. And it's a great way to just kind of get different opinions because we had the HIP staff and then we had our outreach specialists and then we also had volunteers or friends and family, whoever wanted to join, can join. So it was just like open invite and then you can be part of the space and share what you want. And then if if not, silence is 100% valued as well. So yeah. (laughs) I, I appreciate that that last note, right? Because it's okay to just sit back and, and listen and learn, right? Like, yeah, I feel like some sure. of us, especially myself, I could definitely take that note and listen more and speak less. So <laughs> I, I appreciate that. Well, those are all the questions I had for y'all today. Thank you so much for, for joining us for this conversation. I learned so much from both of you. And I feel like hearing the work that you two are doing, all the creative Uh, solutions that you are having to fill some of the gaps in terms of lack of infrastructure and local government not being 100% supportive or providing the support that we need rather it is very um, inspiring so I appreciate both of you your work and and joining this conversation and and teaching us quite a bit but before we jump off could you all share with our listeners where they can learn more about your work your organization and how they can get involved with what y'all are doing you can find us online on social media, Lift Up Contra Costa Action. Uh, that is our tag handle for Instagram, Twitter, and I believe TikTok. <laughs> uh, um, um, our website is currently under development, so we don't have our website presence up just yet, but you can definitely find us on Instagram and TikTok on uh, Lift Up Contra Costa Action. And then you can go ahead and find HIP at, at HIP, H-I-P, all capital, California. And then that'll be for Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, all of the above. It'll be at HIP, capital H, capital I, capital P, California. All right. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you for the space. Of course. Be well. And now, your shot of courage. On August 3rd, 
Courage California team members joined members of the Dream Alliance for Lobby Day to ask elected leaders to pass impactful legislation, including AB 256, which would make the California Racial Justice Act of 2020 retroactive, ensuring that people now in prison and jail can challenge racial bias in their convictions and trials. AB 257, which would enact the Fast Recovery Act to improve standards for workers in the fast food industry. This act would bring together workers, industry, and government to help solve problems like low wages, sexual harassment, and violence on the job. SB 1382, which would reduce financial barriers to purchasing new and used zero emission vehicles and hybrid vehicles through the Clean Airs for All program by exempting these vehicles from the state's sales tax. And 2419, which is also known as California's Justice 40 Act, which would have invested at least 40% of federal climate infrastructure funding to communities that have been historically neglected by discriminatory practices. But unfortunately, this bill has died in the Senate Appropriations Committee. For a full list of Courage California's priority bills and their status, visit couragecalifornia.org. You'll find a tab under Campaigns dedicated to our 2022 priority legislation. Things will start moving fast, as the last day for the governor to veto or sign bills will be September 30th. And then we are right back into election mode. That's right, California. Our general election is on November 8th. Your general election ballot will include seven ballot propositions. And Courage California has taken a position on the following measures. Courage California recommends yes on Prop 1, which would amend the California state constitution to prohibit the state from denying or interfering with an individual's reproductive health decisions, including their right to choose to have an abortion and their right to choose or refuse contraceptives. And yes on Prop 28, which would require the state to set aside a share of its revenue, likely between $800 million to $1 billion per year, for arts and education classes in public schools. And yes, on Prop 29, which would help ensure dialysis patients receive safe treatment in dialysis clinics under the care of a doctor or another highly trained clinician in case of emergencies. And yes, on Prop 30, which would impose a new 1.75% tax on any individual's income of more than $2 million per year to raise between 3 to $4.5 billion annually to help fund greenhouse gas-reducing initiatives. And yes, on Prop 31, which would uphold a 2020 law banning the sales of all flavored tobacco products. The last day to register to vote is October 24th. Visit CourageCaliforniaInstitute.org for voter registration resources. And keep an eye out for our statewide multi-issue voter guide to be released in late September. Before I sign off, I'd like to personally invite you to Courageous Voices One Movement, our virtual event happening on September 14th at 5.30, featuring LGBTQA plus activist and best-selling author of All Boys Aren't Blue, George M. Johnson. Your ticket purchase will directly support our voter outreach efforts for the critical November midterm elections. Purchase your ticket today at bit.ly slash courageous voices or visit couragecalifornia.org and look at the top right hand corner to purchase your fundraising ticket. Courage California envisions California as a model of progressive, equitable, and representative democracy that sets the standard for our country, but we can't do it without you. So show up to the ballot box and vote. Hold your electeds accountable. And if you can, join us at Courageous Voices One Movement on September 14th. I hope to see you there. I'm your host, Angela Chavez, and this has been Courage. It looks good on you. We hope you tune in next time, California, because with the 2022 ledge cycle coming to a close, the upcoming general election, and the Supreme Court returning in the fall, we really are just getting started. So if you like this podcast, please rate it and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts from. And of course, we'd like you to share. Because with you fashioned in Courage, we can create a California that represents and serves all. Let us know your thoughts about this episode by tagging us at CourageCA and using the hashtag CourageLooksGoodOnYou.